Okay, so I'd like to talk about some stuff about the tenfold way that I didn't talk about in my recorded talk. Um, so just to sort of, so I'm hoping this will be enough uh, <laughs> to cover all the material that was in the talk in a very uh, distilled way. So we're, I'm looking at Clifford algebras, cliff n, where you put in n square roots of negative one that anti-commute with each other. And so there's these forgetful functors that a representation of cliff n gives you a representation of cliff n minus one. And so then, so I'm trying to show how you get all of the compact symmetric spaces in Carton's infinite families of compact symmetric spaces out of Clifford algebras. And so the idea is you take one of these forgetful functors and you take an object in the second category, the representation of cliff n minus one, and you look at this F inverse of it, which I will- homotopy fiber, or you call it yeah, an essential fiber. fiber or mm -hmm. essential fiber of it, yeah. And which I'm going to say some stuff about. Uh, and, and then that is a compact symmetric space. And okay, you okay, get, okay. Well, yeah. can I acclimatize yeah. myself? Okay, so, okay, you've got this note, Clifford notation with one index, and you could have more indexes, but this is like the, right? I can think of Clifford algebra as passing through uh, some sort of inner product spaces, so that you're using positive definite inner product spaces. Yeah, then the reason why I'm only thinking about those is because the other Clifford algebras give you non-compact. Morita yeah. are the other Clifford algebras are Morita equivalents to, to those ones, so we don't oh. get anything really new for oh. these purposes by putting in square roots of positive one. All right, I'll have to think about that. Morita equivalent over. The over wheels. the you're here 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 I'm talking about real Clifford algebras. Um, okay. And then also I'm saying by the way you can do the exact same thing for the complex Clifford algebras, and then I'm writing those with a different notation that looks like the the fancy complex numbers C. Okay. Yeah. And um, but basically. Oh, whose idea was that? I mean, it's cute, but I'm not sure. I don't hate that. But um. I, I meant that literally. Whose idea was that? That was I don't. Idea. <laughs> I don't actually know. It's not mine. I yeah. okay. Uh, um, it's sort yeah. of standard. Okay, uh, but but we get eight different. Uh, there there are eight Morita equivalence classes of these real Clifford algebras and two of these complex ones. I mean, there we aren't going to there aren't going to be any meaning of lift jokes in here, right? Um, lift no. Okay. Um, uh, so we get we get ten. But, but you, you've already you've already surprised me with this idea that uh, maybe I'm supposed to know this, but you already surprised me with the idea that the positive definite that everything's Morita equivalent to a positive definite one. But I'll I'll, I'll have to think about that. Um, yeah, I could if I switched over to um, a whiteboard type medium, I could tell you about those or you could like look at the wikipedia table of well or maybe maybe i could just maybe i could just treat that as a homework exercise for me yeah yeah that's something that other people ask about this because it sounds like i'm leaving a lot of stuff out uh but i'm actually for the purposes of this i don't think i'm leaving much out although they may still reveal some extra interesting structure about what's going on so so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to skip the details, which we can come back to, of what, what it actually looks like. You know, what what, what do we what do we get? But I, instead, I'm going to. Well, can can I think about your the, the the idea that it's a you said it's a compact symmetric space. It itself is a compact symmetric space. Yeah. Uh... You may. If you if you um, if you think about that, you will probably bump into a problem 
if you think about it hard enough, you'll bump into a problem which will need to be resolved by me explaining what exactly I meant by a representation of a Clifford algebra. Well, um, so is this going to be star representations? Or? Yeah, so these are going to be star representations. That's right. So okay, if we didn't stick in that star business, we'd be getting like non-compact spaces of... So for example, the space of all complex structures on a real Hilbert space is, is a non-compact. Right, and, so, and some of this is now coming back from earlier discussions that we had on tenfold way. Um, uh -huh. uh, some, some of this was already implicit in, in, or maybe explicit in some of the stuff you told me in the previous discussion. Um, but but let, me just, let me just think about it for a second. So a compact symmetric space, First, okay, oh, let's ask a stupid question. So you, you're, you're talking about the inclusion from n minus one to n. What about, you know, from n minus two to n or something like that? What, what's that space like? I want to think about those more, but I believe they are, I believe they're not compact. I believe they're compact, but they're not symmetric spaces, I think. Okay, I think okay. Just... Yeah, it should, be, it should be interesting to think about what they are, but. So when I get to the end of this little spiel, I will say something about why we're getting compact symmetric spaces from what, from what I am doing. And then it could be sort of clearer what we'd get if we forgot from cliff n down to cliff n minus two. So I'm very glad you picked up on that because it, like I just realized eventually, hey, I should look at those as well. They're probably pretty interesting things, but I think they're not going to be technically symmetric spaces. That is, they're not going to be symmetric spaces, I think. Well, again, I have a feeling you gave some hints about this already in some previous discussion that, what am I going to try to say that, the, I don't know, this is a stupid guess, but I mean, the, the compact symmetric space has like a one parameter group of transvections or something like that. And maybe there's a higher parameter group of transactions or something. If you have, I don't think you mean a one parameter group of trends. Okay, yeah, no, well, no, no, that's not right. <laughs> okay, but, but a one parameter. A... Yeah, no, I don't. I, I, I didn't say that right. I didn't say that right. Um, Why don't um... you hold off on that? By the time I get down to showing why we get a compact symmetric space you'll see that there's a one something or other. There's one something or other. And then and then for these, uh, <clears throat> for getting down from cliff end to cliff end minus two, we get two something or others, yeah. So I think you're basically on the right track there. But Right track, but I said it very wrong. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm, being, I'm being like a good teacher is supposed to be. Right, <laughs> right. okay. But normally I don't do, especially with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I'm still I'm still trying to catch up and follow along here. Um, so I'm okay. going to start. Okay, so I'm going to start by talking more about this. What is this essential fiber? And that was like the part that is probably like in some way like you you didn't know this too well, and then the people who I was talking to before didn't know it well enough. And so either case, maybe it's pointless to talk about it. But anyway, I'm going to tell you about it. Uh, what the essential fiber or the well properties of the yeah what is the essential fiber and then what you know and then properties of the essential fiber in so, this example or in general leading up to this example but starting out very generally and sort of zooming in on this example. okay I'm, I'm not expecting you to surprise me here but go ahead go ahead <laughs> okay okay i'm not going to even try to surprise you but okay but i'll start out by not at all surprising you so what is the essential fiber so we've got a funker from a category X to a category H. We think of it as a forgetful functor, but it's just any functor really. And then if you pick an object in the codomain, then you know, the essential fiber will have objects in the domain and, the, and they'll be, well, sorry, they'll have objects which consist of an object in the domain and an isomorphism from the functor applied to that object to your chosen object in the codomain. So f of x doesn't need to equal h, but f of x needs to be equipped with an isomorphism to h. 
And then there are morphisms between such gadgets, which respect that extra structure alpha. So we uh, have this commuting triangle that is part of the structure of a morphism. Yeah. Okay. And, but the interesting thing is that in this setup here, we could, the essential fiber could be a category. I mean, it is a category, <laughs> but it could be like a full fledged category. Whereas in our examples, it turns out that the category is just a discrete category. It's just a, or it's equivalent to, sorry, it's equivalent to a discrete category. So it's basically just a set. Um, and so I wanted to. I mean, that means it's a discrete vibration. Right, I guess. Um, which means, <laughs> which means yeah. it's a fun, fun way to think about it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that you should just be able to think of, you know, the corresponding set valued functor, um, um, which should be interesting in this example. But I, but I don't really see, the, see what it is in the examples yet. But it should be something nice. Uh huh. I think yeah, that's good. But so here I was sort of trying to. I was like, I mean, wait, 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 wait. wait. Sorry, sorry. Let me let me try to fix slightly what I'm what I just said. Um, okay. So I, I think I was already anticipating the idea that this is really going to be about groupoids rather than categories. In our example, in our examples, I, I, I made our categories be groupoids because in our my example i wanted the morphisms to just be sort of unitary rep morphisms between star yes. representations yeah and i yes. have no way to pick out the unitary ones out of the no easy way to pick out the unitary ones from the general ones except to throw out everything except the unitary ones and then getting a groupoid of star representations and unitary maps between them. Right. So in that context, what I said about discrete vibrations or something like that is probably correct. Um, right. And then, and then also in that, it could be something my, my trickier in the worrying about this thing being case. a general category was irrelevant. I could have just said that the in that example we know right away that. All these alpha, all these morphisms phi are invertible, so you get a group one. Yeah, but here for some reason or other, I'm just starting from sort of the general uh, theory of essential fibers. It's sort of more general than what we really need. Well, but okay, but now it is seeming very tempting to guess what is this set valued functor it's just kind of giving us the set of places that the extra basis vector can go um so it's like you know commuting let's see is that make, is that make, making sense let's see uh yeah. let me tell the listeners what the hell you're talking about so yeah okay. we have a representation of a star representation of cliff n minus one and the and what you're the set that you're talking about is the set of ways of extending it to a representation of cliff n so you're looking for an action of an extra square root of minus one so some operator that squares to negative one and anti-commutes with all the n minus one previous square roots of negative one and i'm hoping that has some vivid geometric interpretation so keep going yeah yeah i mean that set is gonna be this compact symmetric space by the way that, yes that is yes set. So, that's yeah. right that, that's that is the set well this is gonna be a set f inverse of h yeah right. so but yeah but i mean there are more yeah there should be like more and more vivid geometrical ways to think about it as we go but let me do this category theory stuff <laughs> yeah so I mean, you also got me wondering about whether this compact symmetric space is visibly going to be a conjugacy class here um, or something like that. But uh, keep going. <laughs> OK, so this is just general nonsense that I had to learn. OK. So, so anyway, if you have any old functor, <clears throat> then it turns out that if that functor is faithful, 
then the essential fibers are, sorry, then the essential fibers are posets. So like a good example would be like the forgetful functor from topological spaces to sets. That's a forget, that's a faithful functor, but the essential fibers aren't just they aren't just sets, they're not equivalent to sets, they're actually posets, because there's a poset of topologies that you can put on. Yes, it. yes. Okay. But uh, but then, so uh, that's one way of simplifying the essential fiber <laughs> is to demand faithful, F is faithful and you got a poset. But then another way to do it is you can demand functor, uh, reflect isomorphisms and then your essential fiber is a groupoid uh, so for some reason reflect isomorphisms is also called conservative and I've sort of at least temporarily bullied into using that term even though I don't really doesn't mean I don't like it because it doesn't remind me of. I, I have some idea of the history of that, but I'm not sure how much I like it either. But uh -huh. okay. Uh, anyway. That's interesting, though. In, in the 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 conservative ones have uh, essential fibers which are groupoids, and the faithful ones have essential fibers which are postsets. Th are those equivalent? Did you say that those that that's actually? Uh, I didn't say it, and that's why I don't dare say it. So yeah, it's a, but it's a question. You could ask yeah, whether those a, are equivalent to uh -huh. yeah, that would those be properties of the true. yeah. Seems, it seems like it's a good chance that that uh -huh. might be true. Yeah, often that's a good thing to think about. So it turns out that uh, in our example, both these properties are true. Uh huh. Uh, and I guess that's true. Like whenever you're forgetting from, when you've got like a forgetful functor from like representations of some big algebra down to representations of some smaller algebra, the, it's um, the you, yeah, it's pretty easy to see that you're just forgetting extra structure. Then so it's faithful, and also that if the map of representations of the smaller algebra had an inverse, then that inverse will actually be a morphism of representations of the larger algebra so that it's conservative. So we have both of these properties. And then as you already no doubt noticed, when something is both host set and a groupoid, it's equivalent to a set. So then the essential fibers are two sets. So I'm just gonna say it's a set. Um, case we're in in our and then and then what's this baloney here ah uh, actually Actually, I think there's a mistake in this slide. <laughs> About what? Um, so, huh, this is a stupid mistake, I think. So here I was pointing out and what the con supposedly pointing out the consequences of another. Yeah, this is a stupid mistake. Um, I was pointing out the consequences of yet another assumption that you could put on your functor. Um, but in fact, we don't need that extra assumption to get the consequences. So already from the, so for, forget this extra assumption, <laughs> I think. So already from what I just said, like say, say we're in this case where the functor is faithful and conservative, then 
it it turns out that that so the, then the essential fiber is some set right and then if you have and any automorphism of the object down in the base that you're taking the essential fiber of, you get an automorphism up top. Why do you get an automorphism up top? Well, let's see, maybe actually, true, sorry, wow, this is really bad. Hmm. Ah, see, I already should have talked about this earlier when I was sharper in my mind. Uh, I don't like this. I mean, it makes it makes sense that there's this, you know, all these different properties of these functors, and and right, it has to do with whether the functor is, you know, sort of like what is the functor forgetting? It's it's that kind of thing, you know. Structure is it forgetting structure versus property, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. So I'm definitely only, yeah, I'm definitely forgetting structure. Definitely not forgetting stuff. Definitely forgetting more than just a property. So we're in that kind of case. <clears throat> I'm interested in the case where. Well, okay, so what's this weird what's this weird equation thing here? So I'm interested in this case where when you have an an autumn, you've got an object up above called H. Yes. Right, it's all called X um, that maps down to our chosen object down below called H, at least yes. up to isomorphism. Yes, yes. And so then, yeah, so then it's just always true. I said it backwards is why I was getting confused. It's always true that automorphisms of the object above give yes. automorphisms of the object below. Yes, right. Yeah, and then because our functor was faithful, that's we're assuming, then, then, then the map from the automorphism group above to the automorphism group below is is one to one, and so we so the automorphism group above is of the object above is a subgroup of the automorphism group down below. Yes. Um, so this is like a very Klein, very Klein yes. geometry esque. Yes. That's right. Yeah, and. Yeah, so so without any further assumptions besides this faithful and conservativeness, then this this uh, this essential fiber here will be a disjoint union of G sets <laughs> uh, of set sets on which the Group on which some group acts, uh, and but that well, well, what that group is will depend on which isomorphism class of objects up above you've picked. So you can so sitting so sitting over your object below, you have a disjoint union of sets. On each one of them, you can you can. You can think of it. Sorry, I'm really saying this bad. On you know, on each one of them, I think I'm catching up. So keep going. Yeah, I'm just trying to say this in words and not saying it too well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, like you say, if we just assume that we're just talking about the unitary stuff, then we really are in the world of Kleinian geometry, and it really is very easy this is, to deal with. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. The 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 only thing that's not like the most classic classic kind of Klein geometry here is that we're in a situation where we have this group not acting transitively. Right. 
on the set. Right. And so what this stupid uh, equation is supposed to be saying is that we have a non-transitive group action. And so you can take the, the set and chop it up into orbits on right. which the group transitively and so this is this orbit decomposition right and so the so we're getting a, a disjoint union of these quotient of a group mod another group but the stabilizer subgroup this which is this ought x uh can vary Yes. Um, and I think what I was idiotically saying is that we needed an extra assumption here. But this extra assumption would be the assumption that actually implies that there's just a single orbit. So there's an extra assumption that you can put. Uh -huh. um, it says that if two guys up in the in the in this category above map to isomorphic things, they had to be isomorphic up above to begin with. For, for some reason, this reminds me of, I mean, there's like, there's another property that says that what, that if you have, what am I trying to say? Maybe I shouldn't worry about this too much. Um, uh, or maybe this is really the same thing as conservativeness or something like that, let's say. Well, but in the group point case, we're already, morphism. Equation. I'll have to worry about it later, but I'm, I'm thinking about something like functors where any equation between values of the functor at two different objects. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, it's a vague, vague memory. I'll have to. I'll have to go home later and think about. It. Uh, okay. Let me. Let me uh -huh. try not to interrupt too much here. Go ahead. So yeah. Well, it was good for me to read this just to notice. That there's yes. A, this there's a mistake. So okay. It's gonna be crossed out. I will. Okay. Okay. Thanks to this. Um. So it turns out. That those assumptions, which are really just this faithfulness and conservativeness, actually, uh, they hold for our forgetful functor. And so we get this description of the essential fibers. And as you said, it's a very Klein geometry esque description. Yes. But it's like slightly beefed up Klein geometry, and that the essential fibers are they could be a single homogeneous space of the, the group ought H, the automorphisms of the group of the of the object down below, or they could be a disjoint union of, of sure. different ones. Um, and both of those types of cases occur. I mean, sometimes it's just a homogeneous space, sometimes it's a union. Yes. And that's true in the real and the complex cases because there's nothing special about this at all. Okay, so let me do some, let me do two examples to show like two kind of things that can happen. Okay. So cliff one is the complex numbers, cliff zero is the real numbers. So here what we're doing is we're forgetting from complex. Hilbert spaces, because we're looking at star representations of the complex numbers on a pre-existing real Hilbert space. Yes. So these would be complex Hilbert spaces, and these would be just real Hilbert spaces. And just the underlying. And just the underlying functor. And yes. so, so then the, <clears throat> so this is a situation where any two complex Hilbert spaces with isomorphic underlying real Hilbert spaces had to be isomorphic to begin with. 
Um, and so the, this is a case where we're in the really classic Klein geometry situation where the, the homotopy fiber is a homogeneous space. Yes. And so it's O. So if, we're, if our space down below is odd dimensional, the homotopy fiber would be, the essential fiber would be empty. But if it's even dimensional, there are complex structures. And so we can take R to the 2N and it'll have a bunch of complex structures. And here I'm talking about complex structures that are like uh, orthogonal. Yes. And so we can look at the group of all automorphisms of our real Hilbert space, which is O2n, and then mod the group that preserves a chosen complex structure, which is un, and that quotient space is our is our homogeneous space, and that's our homotopy fiber. Yes. This is the, this is the space of uh, these sort of orthogonal complex structures on a real Hilbert space. Yes. So that's one kind of thing that happens. That's like a really classic one, a good, good one to think about. I, but then, again, just, just, just for just, just, yeah. just, just for reinforcing my understanding here. Um, in, in, in that case, uh, I can think of it more concretely as to me, more concretely as there are these, um, special one parameter isometry groups. And what's special about them is that they move at constant angular speed. Uh-huh. And that's a way of thinking about those, what you're calling an orthogonal complex structure or something like that. Right. Yeah, so you can think I, of them- I, I, hope, I, I hope I remember to say it the correct way, but go ahead, yes? I think that's right, yeah. So you can think of them as circle actions on your, real Hilbert space where pres meaning preserving the inner product on your real Hilbert space at every moment in time. And yeah, in fact, like yeah, Go ahead. yeah. And in fact, that's a really good geometric way to think about it, which I want to someday when I write up this stuff on it, explain more, more how that, uh, how that picture extends to other Clifford algebra cases to other examples of this stuff yeah when i said that they move at constant angular speed maybe i should have emphasized that that's sort of globally other words, every vector is moving at constant angular speed under this okay. uh oh so what i said was wrong right yeah so i just said what circle action i just said a circle an action of the circle on your real hilbert space that seems right, isn't it? <laughs> uh, no, there could be one where you like it acted trivially, for example. Uh, and there could be one where it was acting non-trivially in some directions and trivially in in other directions. So maybe it just needs to act. Well, like uh, I said, if, if if every vector is moving at constant angular speed. Yeah, well, the, well then you're, yeah, but if I'm just saying my, my what I said did not imply that. I just oh, said okay. the circle action. Oh, oh, oh! I, oh, I just okay. said, yeah. So if I think if I just said a circle action, where which had no fixed points, I think that would force it to be at constant angular speed because everything has to get back to where it started from after two time two pi. One I'll way I can do that, that yeah, is not ahead. to move. One way I can do that is just not to move at all. Yeah. Uh. No, I think I, I think we need to say what you're saying. <laughs> it could get around by going. It could take. It could go around twice in the, in the unit time. That we don't want that either. So so we right. just need, yeah, so we so we oh, have. Well, but it, but in fact, you just fixed it again. I said constant angular speed, but I should have said standard constant angular. Speed. You know, everything yeah. is yeah. moving speed at the same one. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 Right. That's right. Okay. Circle actions where everything moves along at speed. One, one, yes. and then we'll get back to itself after time two pi. Yeah, that's right. Okay, good. Well, how many mathematicians does it take to? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we should normalize the speed at one or at pi. I don't want to worry about that. Go ahead. I like I like one. Okay, 
uh, and then I don't mind. I don't like. I like the circumference of a circle to be two pi, and so that okay. If you move at speed one, you get back to where you started from at two pi. So okay, okay, but it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So now here's the, here's like a more exciting case. Um. Well, so cliff seven doesn't really matter what <laughs> cliff seven is so much as the fact that it's category of uh, star representations is the category of real Hilbert spaces that are written as a direct sum of two parts. Um, written as a direct sum of two parts. An orthogonal direct sum of two, two parts, a Hilbert space direct sum of two parts. So cliff seven, I mean, I'll, it's it's an it's some algebra. It's Morita okay. equivalent to R plus R. Maybe that's okay. Fair important. enough. Fair enough. Yeah. So that it, R plus R, its star representations are going to be rep a Hilbert space that's chopped okay. into two parts. Okay. And then this forgetful functor is just uh, forgetting that splitting, and the this category here is went to the plain old category of real Hilbert spaces. Uh -huh. so, so, so here what we have is a, I'm just calling it like a split real Hilbert space and we're forgetting the splitting. But so now they're- really, you're saying it's like a Grassmannian or something like yeah, that? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So now they're different choices. Or a, a projective space or something like that, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, so, no, sorry, it's not projective space. It's a, right, it's, it's a Grassmannian. It's, it's a Grassmannian, and it's this. Uh, well, we're getting a disjoint union of all the real Grassmannians corresponding to like all the ways of taking an n dimensional real Hilbert space and chopping it up into a d dimensional part, uh -huh. an orthogonal n minus d dimensional part. Uh -huh. So when we do the same prescription, we're computing the essential fiber. We're getting a union of homogeneous spaces. Yeah. Um, and so the traditional, this is an interesting one that we, you and I talked about and you helped me out with because the traditional uh, story is that compact symmetric spaces, you assume that they're connected. That's just the, what they do when they're classifying them, I guess. Uh, right. And so they would say like, oh, this thing isn't a symmetric space, but it's a union of symmetric spaces. But as you noted, um, the one nice way to think about a symmetric space is a space where for any point, there's an obturation of, of <clears throat> flipping through that point or reflecting across that point. And yes. then you can, you can reflect an, any dimensional subspace across any other dimensional subspace in when you've got a real Hilbert space. And so that more algebraic definition of symmetric space is space equipped with this operation. I mean, that also puts a little bit more structure on this thing. It's not just a discrete sum anymore structurally. Am I thinking about that right? Because like different components are acting on each other. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know what that means, but it sounds interesting. Yeah. So, so it's well. One thing that's sort of interesting is that um, in so, so in Carton's classification of compact symmetric spaces into families, some of them are one parameter families, like the last one we saw, where it's just the dimension of something that matters. Yes. yes. But then some are these two parameter families. The two parameter families are they're not that many of them. They're just all gross all these disjoint unions of Grassmannians and you get real complex and quaternionic uh -huh. cases. But but they all they all arise from a this sort of exact same story, but applied to the real complex and quaternionic case. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, um, but anyway, so this sort of explains why you get these two parameter families. Yes, yes. And they're not really just like in some sense, it's still like a one parameter family, but it's a one parameter right. family of, of disconnected symmetric spaces. Right. Disconnected. So, um, so that's that's the other kind of thing that can happen. 
And so, okay, so the question is like, why in the world are these things symmetric spaces? Um, so I'm using this fact that you can get a symmetric space when you have, well, depending on how generally you define symmetric spaces, the, the key is that you have a, a group with an, with an involution on it, but then for the technical reasons of getting what Carton to be compact symmetric spaces, we'll start with a compact simple Lie group with an involution. Just for example, like Carton would not call like a, a torus a compact symmetric space. It's too, it's too abelian. <laughs> so that's why we're doing this simple. Uh -huh. um, right. So, but anyway, we'll stick with tradition here. So we'll do a compact, simple Lie group with an involution, and then it'll have this subgroup of the elements that are fixed under the involution. And then the quotient will be a compact symmetric space. And part of the deal here is that a compact, simple Lie group has a God-given Riemannian metric on it coming from the killing form. And then... yes sort of inherited from that this quotient space gets to have a Riemannian metric so this so in the in Carton's approach to symmetric spaces the kind we're talking about now are Riemannian manifold so this is a Riemannian manifold in this um but the more sort of algebraic side of things that I imagine you prefer Jim and probably probably I do too is that this this quotient space here gets to have this kind of flipping operation that given two points on this G mod K, you can reflect one across the other. And that arises from this, because if you take one of your points to come from the identity in G, then flipping around it is just applying this involution. Yeah, so, and, 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 and so, I mean, infinitesimally, that's like a Lee triple system. Uh, that's giving you a Lie triple system. And macroscopically, it's giving you an involutory quandle or something like that. Uh-huh. Yeah, so so that's... You know, the, 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 let's see, the, the, the Lie triple system is the, the transvection-y part, the skew symmetric under the involution. Uh, right and 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 you know if if you think about right the the fixed points of the involution those are closed under like Lie bracket or something like that but if you think about how you know what happens if you start off in the sort of odd sector rather than the even sector then you have to like bracket three of them together to get something back in the same place again or something like that and that's where this Lie triple bracket uh, uh -huh. shows up. So right. yeah, yeah. I, you know, on yeah, good you days, I me. probably can remember how a lot of that works, uh -huh. but yeah. yeah. Yeah, you taught me all that stuff. And then there's this other point of view, which is you think of the, of a, you think about a Lie algebra that is Z mod two graded and the even part so the Lie algebra would be the Lie algebra of this group G, the even part would be the Lie algebra of this subgroup K, and then the odd part would be the orthogonal complement of, of that. And so that's another way to package the information. And so this, yeah, so this Lie triple picture, you just only keep track of the odd part and you try to express everything in terms of, of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. So yeah, there are many nice, Pictures of this. So, okay, so now I wanna. So what, so now I'm, the point is that if you have this forgetful functor between categories of star representations of Clifford algebras, and I'll pick an object I'll pick a representation of cliff n and I'll forget it down to a representation of cliff n minus one. And then we'll have these a group running around in the subgroup. We'll have the group of all 
automorphisms of our representation of cliff N, and then, but then there'll be a larger group of automorphisms of the underlying representation of cliff N minus one. So you can think of, you can think of <laughs> being an automorphism of cliff N as a special property of being an automorphism of cliff N minus one, but you, you get, you preserve the extra square root of negative one. But yes. then the thing is, so you get this group and subgroup picture, but then the uh, key is that I'm going to show that there's actually an involution on the larger group that makes the smaller group be the fixed points of that involution. So we're in this case where the quotient of the big group by the little one is not just a homogeneous space, but it's actually going to be a symmetric space. And, but that's just in this example, using using some special properties of this example, where this example means, I don't know, something like this Clifford algebra stuff or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. So that's what I'm about to show you is how, how do we get the, how do I get this involution out of this Clifford algebra stuff? Yeah. And, and it took me a sadly long time to figure it out, but it turns out to be like incredibly simple. Can you think about it for a minute? <laughs> okay, I'll hide the answer here. I mean, you know, you know, I mean, you know, you, like you said, you're thinking of this as the extensions to the last basis element. Uh -huh. um, and I'm just trying to think of some way to sort of flip the action of the last basis element or something like that. That uh, is basically that. Yeah, I, I thought of that before I thought of <laughs> before I thought of it this way, okay. like evolution. But yeah, okay. so I mean, you can guess what the way to flip the last basis element is, I guess. Just right? taking an in inverse or something like that. Uh, yeah, I guess so. But I was going to say it's negative. But I guess the inverse of a square root of negative one is the also the negative of the square root of negative one. So so it's the I like think of it as like yeah. So it's sort of a Galois theory kind of thing. Like when you're making up i, I could make up i, and you could make up negative i, and they'd be they're both equally good choices yeah. of square root of negative one yeah so, sounds right so in general when you're extending a representation of cliff n minus one to cliff n if you have a way to do it you have this last square root of minus one i could have picked negative that and mine would work too uh-huh yeah so that's that's a good way to think about it okay um and but for some reason or other i wanted to think about it in terms of an involution of a of a group, which is like a different way to think about what's going on. So it took me a little while to translate what we were just saying into the language of of, the, of that language. So here's so here's how that works. Okay, so Cliff N has a representation on some on some vector space X. Yeah, and then. It has this underlying representation of cliff n minus one. Yeah. I'm going to call that H. That's the underlying representation. So the question here is like, well, we've got this group of automorphisms of, of H, the representation of cliff n minus one. And then some of those will be automorphisms of X. They'll be the ones that commute with the action of the last square root of minus one. So there'll be these group elements that commute with the representation of En, the last square root of minus one. Yeah. But, but okay, but we want to show that this subgroup is the subgroup that's fixed under some involution to get ourselves a symmetric space. So our involution, what is it? It's just the obvious thing. You, It's that any automorphism of the representation of our little group, our littler Clifford algebra, we can just conjugate it with the action of the last square root of minus one. And we get a new, that will be a new automorphism of our uh, representation of the smaller Clifford algebra. Uh, because if you can put, yeah, you can check, <laughs> you can check that you can, the guys in our smaller Clifford algebra, they anti-commute with the last square root of minus one, but 
when we do this kind of thing, we're like sticking in the square root of negative one, that last square root of one twice once in its inverse. And so, so anything in our smaller Clifford algebra will, if it commuted with G, it will commute with this whole big fat thing here. It's sort of like picking up two minus signs and you get back where you started from. So that's, so that's how we get a map from odd H to odd H. And then that will be an involution because if you do it, if you conjugate by a square root of minus one twice, you, you it's, you're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. So, so then clearly the fixed points of that involution are just the guys that commute with the last square root of minus one. The fixed points of this map here are just the G that commute with the last square root of minus one. So that's a, that's just like another way to think about, yeah. about this. So that's how, that's how we, so that's why we get these, um, compact symmetric spaces. Okay. And maybe just for fun, I'll go back and like look at the examples. So like the real ones are the most interesting ones. So these are these categories of star representations of Clifford algebras. And one interesting thing that I hadn't completely noticed, although it's, is that as, as just ordinary algebras, we're getting some, and or star algebras, we're getting some duplications here. That is like, like quaternionic Hilbert spaces is showing up twice. Yes. And complex Hilbert spaces are showing up twice. Yes. In fact, the whole chart has symmetry along this funny axis here. Uh-huh. Um, and so, so although sometimes I may have like said, oh, there are eight Morita equivalence classes of real Clifford algebras. That's only true if you think of them as super algebras and think about their super categories of super representations. Yes. But think of them as ordinary algebras. They're not eight, they're fewer than eight. <laughs> there's just there's just one, two, three, five, four, five. Yeah, there's just five. Um and and so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you like these forgetful functors that go down, that move around counterclockwise around this, yeah, around this chart. And so be, the cool part is that because there are just five different <laughs> things here, we can we don't have to write eight, all eight of them. We can just write five of them. And so we get this kind of picture here. So what I've done is I've like taken that circle and I sort of folded it over. Sure. Um, and so the cool part is that, so these arrows here are these forgetful functors. So they're sort of going around in a loop, except that we squashed the loop down to it. <laughs> yes, yes. Line segment. Um, and the really cool part is that, right, so we got forgetful functors going both ways. And it turns out that they are actually adjoint uh -huh. functors to each other. If, if we think of these as cat full-fledged categories, now, not, now I want to think of them as categories, not just groupoids, so that I can right. adjoint functors. Um, and so, so we get things like, yeah, so like there's this one thing where you like have a, a split real Hilbert space and you forget the splitting and you just get a real Hilbert space by taking the direct sum of the two pieces. So that's a forgetful functor that I, that I think I mentioned going from rep of cliff seven to rep of cliff six, but there's also, but you can also think of it the other way. There's a forgetful functor from real Hilbert spaces to, well, you don't normally call it a forgetful functor, but there's a forget, there's a functor going the other way, which is just, you take your Hilbert space and you make two copies of it and get a split. You get, you just sort of double it up and you get a split Hilbert space. And those are, so those are both right and left. I think they're, these are always like ambidextrous adjunctions. They're both left and right adjoints of each other. Well, that's, I mean, that's kind of what I'm trying to, think of right now let me think um uh let 
Ambidextrous adjunctions. Well, the, um, are they the you know sort of trivial kind of ambidextrous adjunction? You know, where there's no reading or, or something. Uh, well, the most trivial kind is an equivalence, but and they're not those. But you meant some other kind of trivialness. Yeah. What was that student of yours who went over to England with Aaron Lauda? Aaron Lauda was uh, about ambidextrous adjunctions. Yeah. And I think he was talking about you know the breeding aspect of, of them. I mean, which again goes from Vaughn Jones or something like that. Um, uh, uh, that's an, I don't, yeah, uh, I, for some reason, I don't really, I don't really understand if you like, just give me an ambidextrous adjunction, how I can, what I mean by it being, what you mean by it being trivial or not in this sense. Well, it's like the braiding just reduces to symmetry or something like that. But where does um, this braiding come from? <laughs> that is, I have an adjunction that gives me like a Frobenius algebra object. We we talked back in those days about like the walking ambidextrous adjunction and how yeah and how that gives you the walking Frobenius monoid. That's walking. right. I'm in, I'm not sure I remember thinking about that, that this way, and a lot of a lot of the details are not you know clear uh -huh. in my mind at the moment, but. I don't know if there is an, a, I don't know if in the absence of any extra structure, whether you can get some kind of braiding like structure out of an ambidextrous adjunction. Uh, I think you can, but I'd have to stop and think about what that means. But, but, but that's actually not what I'm worrying about right now. What I'm worrying about right now is the idea that, um, what am I trying to say? That I mean, how does that work that a, I'm actually wondering about the idea of, you know, an, 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 an adjunction of adjunctions, which is actually a, I guess we don't have that here. Is that right? You don't, you, you don't see any examples of something that's. Right. I mean, there are these very tight. Am circles of adjunctions where it's where it really is amb ambidextrous and you just you know keep on flipping you know you take the left adjoint and the right adjoint and the left adjoint and the right adjoint and you're just flipping and back flipping mm -hmm. back and forth between these two points in a two-point circle but there are other Longer strings, which you know, you, you take the left edge onto something and you get something different, and you take the right yeah. edge onto that and you get something different, and you keep on going like that. Yeah, we're not getting anything like that, I think. Uh, yeah, I guess not. I've never, I was, I was just wondering, there any, does yeah. anyone ever, are there any examples where you do that and it has some finite period other than two? I only know about examples where like they go on forever. I, mean, uh, I there don't are know examples offhand. where they go on forever, but but, but those examples don't sorry i'm just i'm just saying i, I, I only know like yeah period two and period infinity and i'm not sure of him. I'm, I'm not sure of him but it wouldn't yeah. surprise me if there was some other uh-huh that would periods. be cool that would be really cool um um okay so we get, okay yeah, yeah go ahead so we get these nice um we get this nice story and then here i'm writing out these symmetric spaces that we get yes and so the blue ones are well wait are, wait wait wait, wait. Uh, could you go back to the previous yeah yeah okay the one before that the oh. circle one okay so these are these are the categories okay, okay. Then, but 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 then but then i i thought you were gonna have you know, staggered steps between them. So it wouldn't well, be. Well, I should. Yeah, I'm just not good enough at drawing. So the oh, symmetric okay. spaces sort of live in the spaces, in the species between them. Right. Okay. And so, so what I'm going to do is. So notice oh, you're going to use, so because of that funny axis, you're going to use that as the new vertical axis or something like that. The new vertical axis is going to be, be located so that 
Yeah. Year. Yeah. Is... I mean, that might even be a good idea. I don't know, but. Well, it's a nice idea because it, in the sense, just in the sense that it makes for a very uh -huh. pretty picture where, where the guys on the vertical axis are the homogeneous, are the symmetric spaces that are actually groups. Right. And, and one of them has to do with the real numbers and one to do with the quaternions. Right. And then, yeah, so that, that's the only reason why, why it's nice. Um, I mean, you, yeah. So anyway, that, 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 that's what you get. And so you get this space of complex structures, space of quaternionic structures. You get a real Grassmannian and a quaternionic Grassmannian. And then you get these ones that I consider like the most exciting here where again on you know on good days i'm supposed to remember something about this complex lagrangian grassmannian and these are the ones that i had the most trouble remembering slash figuring out i actually i mean there's some it, connection to the seagull upper half thing or something Sorry. oh wow okay yeah well there's something else that i don't yeah that i'm not that I don't understand nearly well enough yet, which is that all these compact symmetric spaces, they have a Carton dual, which is a non-compact symmetric space. And so one of these has as its Carton dual, I think that's Siegel upper half space. So I think that's what yeah. you're Some, so that's like something an example like that. of a non-compact. Something symmetric. like that. I'll have to think about it, but yeah. I, yeah, and I really have to think about it because I, because I want to like bring in the non-compact sure. duals to these and see how like they're connected to the Clifford algebra picture. Sure, sure. Um, and then let's see, do I do it? Yeah, then just for, just for for fun, I drew the complex, the two complex cases in, inside there. Well, but but once again, the um, I think I may have I don't remember, but I may have complained about this one time or so the 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 in the inner thing is actually a uh wrapping of yeah, it's a quotient z mod two is a quotient group of z mod eight and that's really so if you take if you take that into account then it's still sort of true that on the vertical axis is the groups yeah so i mean it should be like this maps to this yeah but also this maps to <laughs> every other one maps to, every one other one on the outside yeah. every other Clifford algebra on the outside when you complexify it gives you the Clifford algebra on the inside yeah so yeah yeah yeah, yeah and I guess if I got really smart I'd draw like a a two-point circle and then I, like a quadruple cover of it it's like yeah yes. yeah I obviously didn't have the energy to sure do it that way so I'm drawing it this cheapo way. Okay. But um yeah, so anyway, that's that's the story. Yeah. Okay. These Lagrangian Grassmannians are the ones that are sort of interesting because they're a little less uh sorry, I'm gonna turn this phone off. A little less obvious how they're what they have to do with symplectic geometry. Wow. Um, but uh, anyway, so that's it. Okay, okay, okay. There's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of things I should think about here. Um, so um, Did I pause the recording while we. Uh, yes, because as usual, I, I just have to find my notes and stuff before trying to go on with the second part. Okay. Okay. Okay, so hopefully it's visible on the whiteboard. It says something like moduli stack of Z mod three torsors, mm -hmm. which is something I've been talking about. Not sure exactly to what extent I used that particular phrase, but we have been talking about that. And it's, I mean, the way we got into this is because this is my attempt to learn how art and reciprocity works essentially. And uh, I have to admit, I don't know to what extent this approach that I'm using, I don't, I don't know to what extent that really is secretly the same as the standard approach to art and reciprocity. 
or not. But anyway, this is helping me. I think I'm learning a lot by doing this, regardless of how similar and or how different this is from any standard way of trying to understand art and reciprocity. Um, but what I'm going to try to um, focus on now is, is something that I've been running into as a result of our discussions. Um, and, and, and that is really to think in some deeper or more precise sense about what do we mean by a modulized stack or, or more specifically, what do we mean by a stack? Um, and, um, and, and I, <laughs> I mean, there may very well be some people who think that stack is a very precisely defined terminology, <laughs> but I've, um, I'm, I'm not usually one of those people, but um, because like, for example, you know, we often about modulized stacks of something or other, and I usually think of those as being theories or more, you know, from the algebraic viewpoint or the syntactic viewpoint, it's like a theory from the dual geometric or semantic viewpoint, it's like a uh, spectrum of a theory, the spectrum of models of a theory. I think I did threaten at one point, right, that, you know, I claim that a modulized stack is usually a modulized stack of models of a theory. So maybe I should call them model stacks instead of modulized stacks. Uh, but, um, I, I'm not sure I've ever really carried through with that threat. But, um, well, so there's a couple of, there's a couple of related things that people sometimes talk about when they're talking about stacks in the concept of algebraic geometry. And, and this, these, these three, two or three or four related things they show up in some other form in like, you know, the differential geometry version or the topological version of these subjects. But, 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 but let me say what these are. So we have, we have um, the concept of a, I guess we call it something like a total two rig. And that's usually what I mean when I'm talking about stack, moduli stacks. Um, and, you know, it's like a symmetric monoidal total category or something like that. Um, as, as always, I'm not quite sure whether I should really be using the, the class of total categories or the class of, uh, locally presentable categories or something like that. But, um, and by the way, yeah. enriched, the enriched ones or something. Yes, yes, the enriched for some relatively anonymous V um, that, you know, it's it's the usual way. It's it's like a categorification of the way when I'm doing algebraic, ordinary algebraic geometry, ordinary affine algebraic geometry. You know, there's some base ring mm -hmm. that I'm working over, but I'm often very vague about what the base ring K that I'm working over is. Yeah. So here there's some base universe V that we're working over, but I'm often very vague about which one we're actually working over. But then that particular, sometimes we will get very specific about which one we're working over. So um, we have total two rigs, but another thing that we have is um, something which from the al algebraic viewpoint, you call it a commutative Hopf algebraoid. And I'm pretty sure we've mentioned these pretty recently. Commutative Hopf algebraoid. And that, when you think about it, you know, dualize the algebra into geometry, that comes out this, the same thing as um, and what you might call an affine algebraic groupoid. 
which by definition is supposed to be a um, groupoid object in the category of affine schemes. Um, so it's like, you know, we have affine algebraic groupoid and we have commutative Hopf algebraoid, and these are opposite two categories or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. I said opposite two categories. Hmm, I'm not even sure. I, I want to. I don't want to worry too much about how you make them into two categories at the moment. But but they probably do end up being opposite two categories. Um, but let's see. Which maybe, maybe I should put the op over here or something like that. Maybe that will fit with some conventions. So there's things like that. And then what's the third thing? There's probably others as well, but the third major thing that I want to think of that's sort of closely related to these things is, um, well, the ones that were originally called, officially called the stacks, right? So these are like uh, categorified sheaves or something like that. Mm -hmm. And perhaps they, they, they live on the Atal site or something like that. You know, on good days, I might be able to figure out what I mean by the etal site. And then uh, that's like uh, it's like the category of commutative rings mm -hmm. with some Grotendi topology on it. Um, or maybe I should make it, uh, yeah, it's, it, 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 yeah, it's by this etal Grotendieck topology. I'm not just sure I'm describing it the, the exact standard way, but th there's something like that. And then you would have these um, stacks, which would be what? Those would be like, <laughs> what are those? I mean, I guess, I was going to have like a functor from the etal site category to groupoids or something like that, but maybe I should have it be like a a fibered thing or something like that. Uh, S or something like that. Oh, sorry, let me let me try to. Uh, that's getting a little crowded there. Let me try to grow that a little bit better. So what am I trying to trying to say that uh, that uh, we have like uh, how does this work? I, I I haven't thought about these technical details in a long time, but the. Uh, you, you know, you have something called a, a stack, and you could think of it in a number of ways. You can think of it as a uh, well, you have this site category that I'll call it S that has a topology on it, and then maybe there's like this. category over here and it's like fibered in groupoids and something like that and maybe that's equivalent to having like some sort of functor to the category to the by category or category of groupoids or something like that uh-huh probably to category or by category to get the stackiness to show up Right. But to begin with, you just call this thing a pre-stack. Uh-huh. Right. Uh, you just call it a pre-stack. But then, uh, you know, and the pre-stack has no interaction with the Grotendieck topology. Um, but then when you're saying which of the pre what does it mean for a pre-stack to be a stack? That's where you really get into the, the interaction with the Grotendieck topology. And um, so part of the point is that, you know, there's this kind of thing, which is perhaps really stacks. 
there's this kind of thing, which is perhaps, I don't know what various different cultures call these things. I think there's some culture that just calls them groupoids or something like that, which is right, very annoying to people who think that groupoids are groupoids. <laughs> right. I um, didn't even know about this culture that calls those things groupoids, but uh, I think yeah. it's, I think it's, you know, I guess there, I guess I do know differential geometers who have a different way of thinking about groupoids as where they're at least, but that's more like in the smooth world than the affine algebraic world. Yeah. But I think this is the equivalent of that. Yeah. You know, there, there are yeah, certain, I can people, imagine there are certain people who think that, well, group, you know, true groupoids are just so boring that they're not even worth talking about. So we're only going to talk about them if they are, you know, live in some geometric category that we're interested in or something like that. So, I mean, mm -hmm. if, if, you know, yeah. people who live and breathe algebraic geometry, when they say a groupoid, they mean, you know, mean a groupoid that in the world of algebraic geometry. So an affine algebraic groupoid or something like that. Um, and these things, well, some people don't even talk about these things, but I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I guess I'll call these theories or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there are these three interconnected kinds of things. So there's probably a whole bunch of other ones, but they're interconnected partially in the sense that if somebody talks to you about the moduli stack of such and such, depending on who's saying it, there's a good chance that they might be talking about really the way they're thinking of it. There might be any one of these three. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, and well, so for a long time, I've thought about the first thing largely to the exclusion of the other two. Mm -hmm. um, because I just understand things better that way. But there's some interesting stuff going on here, which seems to be telling us to think about some of these other ways of thinking about what's going on, especially thinking about the groupoids, um, the, these affine algebraic groupoids. Um, I have a question. Go you ahead. Think there's like, you think there's some way to like, or do you have any inkling of some way to like adjust the details on these three concepts? You can get some version of them where they actually all coincide. I mean, I guess there yes. has to be yeah, yeah. But, yeah, 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 yes. I don't know the details of that. I know, I know there's you know a, a, a number of people, probably Laurie and so forth, who probably know lots of details about that better than I do. But so yeah, there are there are various interesting processes for getting from one of these three to another one of these three. Mm -hmm. And um you know, if you have two of these processes going in opposite directions, you can kind of take something like the fixed points of the processes or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and if you work out hard enough, maybe you get sort of like the fixed points of all six mm -hmm. of these processes or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh -huh. um, so there are very interesting questions there. Um, I mean, should we mention some ways of... Um, well, there's one that I very, there's one that I do consider kind of rather important. That there's a there's a way of going from here to here, um, and it's called um, the co-modules. Maybe I'll say the the co-module category. So you can start out with a commuter of Hopf algebraid. A commuter of Hopf algebraid has something called co-modules. And the co-modules naturally form a total two rig. And in some sense, that's the right way to get from a commutative Hopf algebra to a total two rig. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, going back is a little bit trickier, but that's that, that's that's what we're really gonna be talking a lot about is going back, but or trying to go back. Right. It's a, it's it's it, it, maybe we'll think of it as sort of like an upstream type process that 
is not that well defined, but it's, you know, it's sort of defined by the well-defined downstream process. I have another question. Yes, so go ahead. In the bottom blob, you have the word groupoid, and then in the middle blob, you have it labeled with the word groupoid in scare quotes. And I'm wondering if if the <laughs> if the bottom blob groupoid is that kind of groupoid. Oh, <laughs> I think yeah, okay, I, right. I think that's the uh, that's the the true groupoids that are too boring oh, for really. Yeah, that's what I thought at first, but then I thought, right, here's some like algebraic geometers who live and <laughs> breathe algebraic geometry. Whenever they say groupoid, they mean. I yeah, I, except that I think it grounds out at, at this <laughs> so, place. I think. Okay, I, I think you know. Don't you know? Don't trust me. I'm trying to get the culture of any any of these cultures correct. Um, so, um, so what am I trying to figure out here? So, uh, well, so. Like, yeah, we're we're probably going to be. We might be thinking about all three of these, but particularly the first two, the theories and the groupoids. And when you're thinking about the groupoids and the theories, and I'm hoping this will, I'm hoping this will match up to some of what you were describing from differential geometry. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to, you have to tell me whether this sounds similar to what you know from differential geometry or different or whatever. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, or again, differential geometry or even non-differential geometry, you know, just point set topology. Have you have you talked to those people or I'm not sure exactly. Topological groupoid. Yeah. People? Yeah. I, I sometimes have, yes. Okay. And um uh boy i have a feeling that somehow you know some of those people would be more apt to talk, to talk about localic groupoids than about topological groupoids i don't know that's true there are those people too yes <laughs> but um but uh well when you're working with the interaction between the theories and the groupoids well, I mean, I guess I guess that's a good question. What would be the analog of the theories in the differential geometric world? Hmm, <laughs> I, I don't know. It might, it might be the same kind of theories. I'm not quite sure. But um, uh, the It's 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 often a good idea when you're dealing with the the affine algebraic groupoids to consider them only up to a some kind of so-called Morita equivalence. Mm -hmm. um, but this is somewhat this is somewhat delicate as to what you know Morita equivalence should mean in this context. So, right, I mean, uh, so like, uh, you know, we have the idea of, uh, again, for the, you know, the plain old groupoids, the groupoids that just live in the set world or something like that. Um, you know, there's a concept of equivalence of groupoids and it's very concrete in a way, right? It's just basically that you have the same, you have a bijection between the isomorphism classes, uh right you know what i mean <laughs> yeah well that's a very harsh way to put it but yeah <laughs> you put, there's that and then each object each class has its own group yeah they're just basically like uh, yeah we're gonna really be, be really nasty you just say like a group is just like a disjoint union of groups and... or well, a disjoint union of groups but each it's a disjoint union of components but each component so each component yeah. is a connected groupoid which right. is not necessarily skeletal, but you could up to equivalence right. make it skeletal. I right. mean, and you know, yeah. there's all sorts of yeah, harsh, ugly or less ugly ways of doing it. And yeah. like if you know, if 
if you really believe in the axiom of choice, then you can, right? The axiom of choice says that some of the very ugly viewpoints and some of the rather elegant viewpoints agree with each other. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, but whereas if you're working with like differential groupoids or affine algebraic groupoids or localic groupoids or, or something like that, right. then, right, That's then it gets tricky. Yeah. Miserably. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, the existence of some sort of functors between the groupoids that you know preserve this extra geometric structure. Uh, it's you know preserving the extra geometric structure is 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 is, is more is is right is something is 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 a more serious thing. Mm -hmm. Um, when there's actually is this extra geometric structure or something like that. So, I mean, what am I trying to say that? So, for example, when let me tell you what I think my definition of, um, yeah, I'm not even sure exactly what the standard definition of uh, Merida equivalence of affine algebraic groupoids is. Uh, mm -hmm. I can imagine all sorts of ways of trying to do it, like maybe saying that, you know, you know, you might define certain kinds of equivalences and then you might take like a two category of fractions or something like that. I don't know. Um, but uh, the way I'm thinking of it is this, that I emphasize that for me, the right way to get from an affine algebraic break groupoid to a theory is to take the co-module category. So for me, two affine algebraic groupoids, G1 and G2, are Merida equivalent, precisely in case their th their theories, their co-module co theories, or whatever you call them, their co-module categories as theories are equivalent as theories. And it's you know easier to say what equivalence of theories is. It's just, you know. <laughs> It's, it's easier. It's, you know, you just have these symmetric monoidal equivalences, symmetric monoidal left adjoint equivalences, or something like that. It's 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 very straightforward to say what the correct equivalences are between the theories. I think, and so you can just. just uh, so when you what? said oh, so when you said co-module category, that's sort of yeah best suited when you're talking about them in terms of commutative hop algebraids, right? That's right. That's right. What's the best way to is there, what's the state if you really want to talk about them as affine algebraic groupoids? What what is the thing that <laughs> is it? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I I I don't remember it. I don't remember the answer to that really well offhand. I mean, you can. What am I trying to say? I have a feeling like Quillen has like some really nice way of thinking about this. What what I'm trying to say is that. If you have, uh, what am I trying to say? If you have an affine algebraic groupoid, then you can have another kind of, you can have another affine algebraic groupoid over it. Uh -huh. And that is, so what is that? That's like, I want to say it's something like a, damn, what is that? I mean, there, there are really good answers to your question. I have a feeling I'm, I'm not sure I can really do a good, we, I think we've talked about it before. Uh, I'm not sure if we have it recorded on the video chats, but um, uh, we've talked about this before. Uh, hmm. Um, I don't remember that for some reason, but okay. Well, it was, it was a relatively long time ago. Um, is this like some version of you're making it sound like it's some version of like switching between indexed categories and vibrations or something? I don't think it's that. I don't. I don't know enough about that to to know whether this is like that. It's it's more like what am I trying to say that? Um, Well, I was just saying that because on the one hand, you could look at 
Yeah. Co-modules of a commutative Hopf algebra, algebroid. Yeah. So that's like some. Uh, no, never mind. <laughs> and yeah, and then you're converting them into affine algebraic groupoids over your given affine algebraic groupoid. Is that? Say that once again. <laughs> so if I have a co-module yeah. of a commutative Hopf algebraid. Yes. I want to see what it does for me when I switch to the language of affine algebraic groupoids. Yes. And it sounds like you're telling me it gives me an affine algebraic groupoid over my affine algebraic groupoid. Yes, but of a very special kind. Um, uh -huh. yeah. What am I trying to say? Um, hmm. I mean, uh, oh, okay. Uh, I, I'll, you know, I'll have to postpone giving any good answer to this question for later. But let me let me give you a very ultra sketchy answer mm -hmm. for the moment. So, one of the degenerate special cases of a commutative Hopf algebra, right? If you think about it, is just a a commutative algebra. Um, that's the degenerate case of an affine algebraic groupoid where where it's it, it you know the group from the groupoid point of view it's just a i guess a, you'd call it a discrete groupoid uh-huh so we get an affine algebraic uh we get we get an affine and yeah, an affine algebraic set. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. An affine algebraic discrete group boy. That's right. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. And in that case, the co-modules specialize, the co-modules of the commutative Hopf algebra, they specialize to just the modules of the commutative algebra. They are the modules mm -hmm. of the commutative algebra. But but you can think of right there's a trick to think of you can think of I th again this is I, th I think this is the quillen trick but i'm not sure if i'm quoting the right person or doing it in the right way or anything like that but there's a way you can think of modules of a commutative algebra as being very special commutative algebras of that commutative algebra <laughs> um uh-huh yeah i think that is a Quillen trick. Wow. Well, yeah. Okay. I'm very confused. But yes, there's Quillen so had a new approach to thinking about tangent about Kähler differentials that I think was this stuff. Yeah. I don't know. That's very well. That sounds very interesting. I'll have to, I'll have to relearn more um, about that. But um, I, I'm just trying to give you a very sketchy answer to your perfectly good question. Just that. Um, uh, uh, were you gonna yeah. answer it? We're gonna. We're gonna. We're gonna take. Say like what kind of. Um, well, like I said, yeah, it's an. You can you can think of an affine algebraic groupoid over an alpha affine algebraic groupoid. Mm -hmm. So I'm willing to. But but then you can you can you can perform a generalization of the Quillen trick at that level. And so that'll end up giving you this thing that's like the generalization of the commutative modules, so the generalization of the modules of the commutative algebra. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's much better answers than what I'm saying, but I did sort of just give a very vague, sketchy answer to your question. Okay. Well, I'll. I won't. I won't express my. <laughs> lack of complete satisfaction because it's sort of obvious but yeah that's right fine. right right you shouldn't be satisfied yet but um but so um at the moment i'm just suggesting of the, the idea that you can use this to motivate what merida equivalence between affine algebraic groupoids should amount to uh -huh. and you know, I'm not sure this exactly agrees with everybody else's definition, but I, I, but this is my motivation for it. That you know, the the, the affine algebraic groupoids 
or the, the commuter of Hopf algebras should be Morita equivalent, precisely in case their co-module categories are equivalent as theories. Um, and so in particular, that, 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 that means that, you know, we're gonna run into pairs of affine algebraic groupoids that are only Morita equivalent um, and that are uh, <laughs> that mm -hmm. that are um, you know they're sort of at, at, if if you're looking at strict isomorphism they actually look quite different but mm -hmm. they're going to be Morita equivalent and it, so right in particular this notion of Morita equivalence it's going to what am I trying to say I mean the I mean, this is this is a lot more delicate in a lot of ways, if, if to the extent that I understand it, it's a lot more delicate than, as we've been saying, than the, the notion of ordinary equivalence between mm -hmm. ordinary groupoids. Um, well, uh, I, 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 let me let me give you an example where you, where you, where, you, where you can see this. And um, boy, I was I was I was actually aiming to be done talking by this time, but uh, we'll, I guess we'll go, go a little bit over. I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, so, um, so, uh, so yeah, let me, let me try to give an example here. Going to a new page. We may have to flip back to page one, but, um, so, um, let's consider, you know, the theory of a Z mod three torsion. So that's a theory, but now I'm going to give a number of pretty different commutative Hopf algebras that are all Morita equivalent to each other because they all give the same co-module category, which is this as its co-module category. Huh? So the, 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 so I mean what, what what would be one of the simplest examples from the co-module viewpoint? Well, so uh, the, the, one of the simplest examples would be the case where this commutative Hopf algebra is actually a commutative Hopf algebra. Mm -hmm. And you know, one, one of the things that's nice about that is that, you know. It's easy, it's relatively easy to understand what the co-modules are from that point of view. It's basically, you know, it's it, it matches up with our notation, with our notion of the representations of this uh alge affine algebraic group. Um mm -hmm. it, it matches up pretty well. So um so, I mean, what are we saying? What is this commutative Hopf algebra? I, and I guess right now, now here, I, I have to try and hope that I don't get too badly confused by Fourier Hopf's duality for Hopf algebras here. Um, so I guess it should be, it should be something like the commutative Hopf algebra of functions on Z mod three. Uh -huh. And sorry, that was supposed to say commutative Hopf algebra. Uh, let me just try to that. Uh, where's my, just desperately looking for my cursor here. Oh, there it is, okay. Uh, and my eraser goes up there. Okay. 
Okay, and then I'm not very good at this. Okay, I do this. I'm still not doing it right. You're still on eraser setting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thought I'd already done that. Okay, commutative Hopf algebra of functions on Z mod three. But I mean, right? That this is this is kind of implying that we have a uh, a base ring or base field or something that we're working over here um uh -huh. which for the moment let's take it to be the rational field um it's possible we might have to make it be the integers at some point but for the moment let's make it be the rational field mm -hmm. um so i think this makes sense yeah the commutative of hop algebra over the rationals of rational valued functions i think on z mod three Mm -hmm. And um, so if you figure out what the co-modules of that are, it is just this thing that we've been talking about. This, you know, it's kind of like mm -hmm. a two vector space that just has these two irreducible objects, one of which is one dimensional and one of which is two dimensional. Uh, it's a two vector space over the rationals or something like that mm -hmm. and um okay yeah I mean I guess what, what right what, what right you get a commutative division algebra from any of these basis objects of this two vector space and from the one I'm calling the one dimensional one that's just the trivial representation that's just you're getting Q itself as the commutative division algebra. But for the other one, you're getting the Eisenstein field as the commutative division algebra of endomorphisms. Uh -huh. So um, right, so that is a commutative Hopf algebra. Um, and it, you know, it, it right, it, it it gives this theory, but but there's something sort of bad about this. Uh, I mean, depending on your viewpoint, there's something sort of bad about this particular commutative Hopf algebra. And what's bad about it is that it only has this one object, right? It's a, it's it's a commute. It's you know, it's an affine algebraic group rather than an affine algebraic groupoid. And that's bad because it sort of conflicts in some intuition way with the fact that there's not just one Z mod three torsor over the rationals. There's zillions, right? There's a very much of an interesting variety of uh, Z mod three uh -huh. torsors over the rationals. Uh -huh. So there's some completely different uh, there's well, there's probably a whole bunch of different uh, commutative Hopf algebraids here or affine algebraic groupoids that um, in some vague sense, are better than this one, but are Morita equivalent to it. They're more, I want to say that in some sense, they're more Morita saturated or something like that. Um, they're more replete or something like that. Uh -huh. And um, yeah. So, what? I think there's some approach to this yeah. stuff where you. I'm probably screwing it up, but it, 
you're making it sound like there's some kind of model category thing where you like co vibrantly this is this is like a model two category so i must be confused but it's a, right it's a, I, I was a, suggesting that before I, you know, version I, of, of, of one of these the of one of these uh uh affine algebraic groupoids that's more unwound yeah. 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 That's probably true. I, I, right. Okay. There, there's probably something go, like that going on. Yeah. That's probably true. I, and and uh, yeah. And I guess I hadn't really been thinking about that uh, explicitly in my mind. But it, so I'm glad that you did bring that up. There probably is something like 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 that going on here. Um, but I'm not going to worry about that too much. But I'm going to give some examples here. Uh huh. So, um, so we have this idea. Well, so so okay. So so first, I'm going to give some examples. I'm I'm going to try to give some examples of. Uh, What I'm going to try to say. So I want to consider some interpretation of theories here. And so which let's see. So so okay. So this is like this is a very this is a very stacky theory that we've got here, right? It's just it's just got like one. <laughs> what am I trying to say? Uh it's uh I mean, its models have its points, its models or whatever have have automorphisms, and that's kind of like what this whole theory is about. Those the automorphisms of the models that they're like Z mod three. Um, so, what am I trying to say? That uh, I mean, you say. It's all it's about, but it's not really literally all it's about. <laughs> there are not isomorphic models too, right? Yes, yes. But this is something I've only been learning about recently or only right. been noticing recently. So I, yeah. you know, I almost wanted to say that it's right. very stacky because there's just one. Right, yeah. No, I mean, there is that, there's, that, there's that trivial towards there, but there are these other non-trivial ones, but somehow... Yeah, I mean, I understand that when you normally talk about torsors, you think of it as a, <laughs> you know, there's like one of, and it's the automorphisms of them that is the fun part. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and 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 now you know now I'm I'm somehow really trying to learn this more sophisticated viewpoint. But anyway, that um, I, I want to have a, I, I want to have an interpretation of theories between this very stacky theory and this very unstacky theory mm -hmm. so a, a very unstacky theory is just like an, an affine variety and the you know the the syntactic category is formed by the modules of that variety and it's the theory of a point of that affine variety so let's see so but which, first of all which direction does it go so it's it's this usual tanakian thing that we talk about which I guess is that you have an associated vector bundle functor. Ah, so it's going in, that means it's going in this direction. So it's going like this to the theory of an A module for some commutative. Sorry, I, I said that wrong. Um, not an A module, the theory of a point of the spectrum of A, which I should draw as. Uh, A, a morphism to the tensor unit from this external commutative ring A, which should be a uh, it should be a tensor monoid hom. I'm trying to express the theory in the syntax of the doctrine. But it, it turns out that, right, so X here, A here is supposed to be some particular commutative ring. And, you know, what the syntactic category 
turns out to be in this case, this is just the category of A modulus. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. so what, I, what I'm trying to say here is that we will get a thing, and we will get an, an interpretation of theories like what I've just drawn here, if we have a sort of geometric Z mod three torsor over the spectrum of the commuter of ring A. And there is some example that we really want to use here. It's something like, uh, I want to say something like, uh, I hope I'm getting this right. I want to say something like A is um, Q adjoin. Uh, how do I do this? Maybe B sub one, B sub W, C sub one, C sub W, D sub one, D sub W, and E sub one, and E sub W. And then modulo some relators. And, and let me try to say what these relators are going to say. So first of all, right, it's, what am I trying to say? These generators are coming in pairs, you know, B1 and BWs, and, and, and those are really sort of like, those pairs, are, you can sort of think of those as Eisenstein generators. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're going to have like, uh, you know, B is uh, equal to, um, B1 times, well, B1 plus, I should say B1 times one, but I mean, the same thing as B1. Uh, what is it? B1 plus BW times W where, right? I mean, yeah, W is the, mm -hmm. our favorite cube, cube root of unity. Um, and you know, and this this yep. same system for B and C and D and E, and then we're going to have B times C equals one, formally in the sense of you know treating the Eisenstein quantities mm -hmm. formally, and D and E are going to be equal to one, and then. B I hope I'm getting this close to correct. There's a bunch of details to check and make sure we got it right. But it's something like B squared times B squared is equal to B, the formal conjugate of the Eisenstein quantity B, the formal Eisenstein quantity B times D cubed or something like that. I think this is is is, is what it's going to going to be working out to. And um, so again, let's do let's try to do a rough dimension count here, okay? Of like the dimension of this affine variety that we're trying to describe here. Mm -hmm. So it's like we have four Eisenstein generators, so to speak, and three Eisenstein relators, right? These are, mm -hmm. uh, so that's, you know, net one Eisenstein generator. So it sort of looks like it's something, well, I, I guess, <laughs> is that right? I mean, I guess you complained at some point that the, that the, that this had a, a B conjugate in here, which means that it's a little bit delicate to count this as three Eisenstein relators, but I think it does work out that anyway. I think it really does come out to be something that's, you know, two, two, roughly two dimensional, morally speaking, over the rationals. 
So it's like a surface over the rationals or something like that, but it may have It's something like that. It's something like that, I think. Um, and this is this variety is supposed to be the parameterizing variety for a family of models of this theory. And in fact, it's supposed to be a sort of repre replete family of models, right? This is supposed to be like, all the models that you'd ever want or need are in here. Um, all right, if you're trying to like, classify all of them, they're all in here. I mean, it's it's almost like this is a classifying space, except it's like an over-classifying space, right? We're getting more models than we really need here. Um, but, you know, but it's, but we're sort of stuck with having, <laughs> oh, well, I mean, the thing that we're going to do is we're going to make it into a groupoid. We're going to make a, a groupoid, an affine algebraic groupoid out of this. Uh -huh. So how does this work? Well, well okay. So Well, when we when we figure out the right theory interpretation here, the geometric interpretation of that theory interpretation will be that we have this bundle of Z mod three torsors over this spectrum, over this affine scheme. And roughly speaking, I, again, I'm, I'm Sorry, I'm doing this so incompetently, but particularly since we're short on time, um, I'll, I'll have to leave a lot of details not very definitely specified yet. But the, the rough idea, right, is that each point of this variety is supposed to be giving us a Z mod three torsor, which morally speaking is the Z mod three torsor given by the formal cube roots of the formal Eisenstein number B. So that's what this is supposed to be. If, if we work this out, you know, if we give a complete description of this theory interpretation, it's supposed to be like that. And that's supposed to give us all of the that's supposed to give us all of the like I said it's supposed to give us more than we'll ever need um you know it's it's uh -huh. and 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 the you know extra multiplicity with which things are appearing is supposed to be accounted for by the fact that what that if If you multiply B, am I saying this right? <laughs> if you multiply B, how does this work? So how does this work? Is it um Right, if you multiply B times a cube. Yes, if you, could, if, you multiply B, if you multiply B times a cube, then you have this other torsor of the formal cube roots of that. But those, but those will be equivalent, right? Because since you're multiplying B times, uh, you know, a formal Eisenstein cube, then the cube roots of, of that thing will be equivalent to the cube roots of B. Mm -hmm. just, just by, you know, multiplying by this thing that it's a cube of, the, the thing, uh -huh. yeah. 
And um, so that's supposed to be uh, that's supposed to be accounting for the 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 this extra multiplicity that we're sort of trying to get rid of by making a groupoid out of, out of this, an affine algebraic groupoid instead of just an affine variety. Mm -hmm. So, so far you're describing the variety, but then you're gonna make that into the objects of a groupoid. That's right, that's right, that's right. That, that's, that's, the, that's the strategy. And so, um, so maybe I'll just call this for a moment. I'll call this one T1 over here, and I'll call this T2 over here, okay? Mm -hmm. And now what if I take, in the, in the world of theories, what if I take this strong push out? like that, uh -huh. then well, there's a technical question here, which is, is this theory P, is that an, just an affine variety? And I think, I think in our particular example, it will be, but I, I, I wish I understood in, 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 in greater generality when you will succeed in getting this to be an affine variety. But if you do succeed in this, getting this to be an affine variety, then that should be the, that should be the thing, the, the object of morphisms. Oh. Oh. Oh, okay. Right, you see what I'm saying? I mean, I mean Right, this this strong a guy, in, a guy in P is a morphism from a guy. You think of it as being a guy guy in a morphism, yeah, a morphism from a guy in the first T two to a guy in the second T two. Yes, yes. So you have you know you have this parameter right. You have this family, and you have two points uh -huh. in this family. One of them is picked out by the one copy of T2, the other one is picked out by the other copy of T2. So you're, so you're getting two points in the family, but they're both giving the same model. So that means there must be, we must be giving an isomorphism between these two models. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> if we can get that to work, then this will be a way to sort of get the, so it's it, it, it's like we're saying, it's like we're saying we're starting out with a family of models of the of the theory, a family of torsors. And we are creating the groupoid of all isomorphisms between all the models in, in those all, 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 all the you know all the pairs of models taken from the Cartesian square of that fam. And, uh -huh. and, 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 you know, if this works, that will give us this, um, this, this affine algebraic groupoid, which we can also think of as a commutative Hopf algebra. And, um, so, So yes, like you were suggesting, I, I, it, right? It's 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 like I'm trying to claim that what that this is a very vibrant groupoid or something like that. Is, is it co-vibrant or vibrant? I, 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 perhaps it's vibrant, but I'm not sure. Um, right, compared to the one that, that was just the commutative Hopf algebra, this mm -hmm. this one that we're getting here seems like it should be. Uh, morally more vibrant in the sense that you were talking about. 
uh -huh. and you're talking about like model structures or something like yeah. that. Uh -huh. And um, so, 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 There's one, yeah, go ahead. there's one, I'm, yeah, I'm confused about a bunch of things, but there's just one I want to talk about, yes. which is that looking back through my notes, I saw that you were like talking about a similar algebra before, but the difference is that you have twice as many generators and you now have relations that are basically just saying that, well, like before you just had like B and D, uh, and now you have like new new guys, C and E that are there just to sh sh ensure that B and D are invertible. And you haven't done that's that. Right. that. That's right. That's right. I, 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 yeah, um, it could be because I made a mistake of, of, of I accidentally omitted that from the previous um, examples, or maybe I had some other trick, or maybe I'm confused. I don't know. That's a good question too. I um, but I I remember when I was doing something very similar to this, and I. Or maybe maybe I had something else in in the in the notation, or maybe it wasn't very clear in the notation. But where I said that you know, B and D, which were probably under different letter names back then, but B and D were in GL one comma E. <laughs> but, but 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 that time E was standing for the Eisenstein uh, right. field. Yeah. Okay. I. Mm -hmm. So yeah, these are excellent questions, but I, I'm just you know yeah that I'm 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 confused enough that I don't have I can't clarify okay. too much. Yeah, no, that's actually helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. So that you're not trying to do something different. <laughs> that's right. I'm trying to do the same thing every time, good, good, and I better, probably it, well yeah. Or the fact that it always seems a little bit different from one day to the next is not very <laughs> encouraging, but. Maybe I will eventually get it exactly right, and maybe then you know we'll give the same answer from day to day. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, all these things need to be clarified and nailed down and so forth. But um, that question of mine makes it sound like I understand what's going on better than I uh -huh. actually do, because that was I sort of like fairly precise question but there are other questions that are that i don't do want, want to, get to do now no just not now okay. because i feel like i want to quit soon but okay sure sure but there are more more questions more along the lines of huh which right is, right um, um the other axis of right the well other stream I mean, of clarity <laughs> right when i thought i was going to try to do a relatively short time today i was going to try to just give some overview, conceptual overview of what's going on. And I'm still just trying to do that. But at this uh -huh. point, I'm just trying to really finish up quickly. But I'm trying to say something that will maybe help with the bafflement. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, I mean, I, I will, I don't want you to answer this question, but I will just say it, which is yes. like, yes, you probably a couple of times yes. explained where this B squared equals B bar times D cubed comes from and I thought at the time that I sort of followed it but right now maybe just because I haven't been thinking about it for a while I'm very I'm again mystified by it right so that's I, like I, more it, important than the other thing that I just said is I forget sure, like sure. Why, why you're doing that sort of I sort of remember but not nearly well enough so sometime I'd like to like Go right. through that. Again. Right. We have to go back, go through that again. But it had to do with you know the sort of Tanakian analysis of the representation category. Um and um so yeah, I'm I'm, I'm just trying to say the intuitive conceptual picture before we quit. What am I so what am I trying to say here? That See, it seems again. I don't know if there's anything anything at all like the standard way of doing art and reciprocity or anything like that. But it seems like what we're saying is that we're going to understand art and reciprocity for these Z mod three torses, for example, 
by having a nice affine family of that includes all the Zen Mod three tortures in the world. So, well, okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh -huh. so let, let's go back for a moment to that very unfibrant thing, which is just the commutative Hopf algebra. So it just has one thing about that. And mm -hmm. see, so one thing about that is that you can get a pre-stack from that. Just by taking, there's a very follow your nose way to get a pre-stack from the group boy. But I think what happens is that for the really nice group boys, the ones that are like fibrant or something like that, that pre-stack will automatically be a stack or very close to a stack. Hmm. Whereas for the ones that are not fibrant, you will have to really stackify them. And what stackifying means is this idea that you have to introduce these sort of, I don't know whether I should call them the local models or the global models. You know what I mean? They're like the, the models that are pasted together by mm -hmm. locally mm -hmm. doing stuff, but putting it together in a global way that's possibly different, possibly a twisted way compared to uh -huh. So that that you know that is how this magic stackification process uh -huh. can account for the fact that there's not just one Zmod three torsor in the whole world in the whole uh -huh. national world. Um, uh, yeah, has anyone ever said that sheafification or stackification is a form of fibrant or cofibrant replacement is that like a known slogan good, i've never good, good, heard good that. question i don't know uh if it were true then it wouldn't be a coincidence that what you're saying is a tendency to happen but it would just be like <laughs> it would be the same same thing but i've never heard of that but. yeah i don't i i'm 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 not quite sure it's it's it, yeah. you know it could be on the right track but I'm not sure if there's a way to get it to actually be true or something. Uh -huh. like that. Yeah, I just have um, to so so the sort of wild guess that I'm su suggesting here is that as we go searching for reciprocity laws that we can understand, and this will include the abelian reciprocity laws that basically amount to art and reciprocity. And it might include some, you know, non abelian generalizations of reciprocity laws. But as we start looking for reciprocity laws, generalizing this example, maybe we'll maybe things will be nice enough that it will be just like this or very much like this in a lot of cases, that the way the reciprocity law will work, and again, this is <laughs> some sort of very generalized concept of reciprocity law, but that's what we're sort of expecting. That, you know, you have to generalize your concepts when you're trying to develop non abelian reciprocity laws. Um, that you will have some sort of nice affine families or you know over complete families of torsors mm -hmm. and the over completeness can be managed by making an affine algebraic groupoid out of it mm -hmm. and then what you will find it well for example in this Zmod 3 case what you will find is that looking at the points right you can you can look at points that that live at, 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 at right it's a scheme so you can look at points that you can look at global points or you can look at points parameterized by this affine scheme or you can look at points parameterized by any affine scheme that's the way a mm -hmm. 
scheme works. And um, so you could look at them over any number field, but you could also look at them over any finite field. Mm -hmm. And if you compare those two together, you should sort of get art and reciprocity to fall out. In this example, for example, but then maybe in all these other examples, or all these other abelian examples. And then we can look for something analogous but trickier to happen in the non-abelian examples. I mean, let's, let's, just, let's just think very vaguely about some possible non-abelian generalization of this. So let's, let's like consider like, let's consider a let's consider the space of all n de degree n polynomials mm -hmm. but think of that you know over i think of that as an affine variety over the rationals mm -hmm. and then try to figure out you know which ones are Try to make a, a groupoid out of that. Try to make an affine algebraic groupoid over that. And the idea is supposed to be that you're interested in the solutions of those polynomials. That is, two yeah. So the roots are isomorphic the, if they give you the same. If they yes, the if same if there's a rational way of transforming from the roots of one polynomial to uh -huh. the roots of, of the other polynomial, yeah, then they're equivalent. And and right, and they'll be. There'll be this very dense dust-like orbits or equivalence classes or whatever you call them, isomorphism classes. Mm -hmm. um, and right, I mean, this should remind us of what we were doing when we were talking about the grotendieck teichmuller theory and the, the design. I mean, right, we had geometric families of torsors, right? I mean, a geometric torsor is really just a geometric family of arithmetic torsors. So, I mean, right, there is this geometric dimensional relationship between the geometric things and the arithmetic things. Uh, I don't get it, but I don't know. I'll have to try to figure out how to say it better. <laughs> we'll just we'll have to try to wrap it up for now. But what I'm trying to say is that You know, the, so the, there are these, you know, they, there are these things we call the designs. I was calling them the designs. What do they call them? Des design or something like that. In, yeah, sure. And um, in Groton Dieck Teichmuller theory. And they, you know, there's some kinds of geometric torsors or something like that. <laughs> Uh, I don't get. I'm, I haven't been thinking about them for a while, so I don't. I don't know if I never knew what you meant would mean by that sentence you just said. I probably. I'll have to try to explain this better, better next time. But I was. I, I was talking, for example, about genus zero des, designs mm -hmm. and how. These are really just given by rational functions. And we were talking about how rational functions have like a numerator and a denominator, but then they also mm -hmm. have a one orator. And then they all and and you know, in those in the in the case of the designs, those, you know, those three special fibers determine combinatorially the whole design, if you think about it the right way. 
Uh -huh. But there's also all these other generic fibers, you know, the K aerators for generic, more generic values of K. Mm -hmm. So for each value of K, each rational value of K, you're getting a sort of arithmetic torsion. And so the whole design is itself a geometric family of arithmetic torsors. And we can try to develop a sort of reciprocity law that classifies in a nice way those fibers, those aerators that I was talking about. What, okay, I get the fibers. What are those fibers torsors of? Well, I'm being very sloppy about that. I mean, uh, I mean, in some cases, they might be torsors of n bank, which are right. I mean, I mean right up the roots of a polynomial is just the torsor of. Okay. Uh, the, the, the roots of the the roots of a polynomial with invertible discriminant is really uh -huh. just a non. Uh, is really just a. Uh, an, an n bang torsor. And so, you know, we're getting all these different polynomials that which all give us different, all, the, all of the same degree n, but they're, but they're, so they're all giving us n bang torsors, but some of them are equivalent and they're equivalent in this very dense way that we have to count for by making, building an affine algebraic groupoid out of this. But this is supposed to be analogous to what we were doing for the Z mod three torsors, except it's just more like much more non-abelian situation mm -hmm. in general. And um, <laughs> I want to quit because I'm fair. I'm a yes, little yes, yes, yes. I, 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 this is the time to quit. But um, I, 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 I want to. I want to a little do more optimistic now. Say it again. I feel a bit more happy about it now than I did. Okay. Five minutes ago, but I'm afraid if sure, sure, about sure. it too much more, I'm gonna. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure, gonna sure. This is gonna stop to quit. We should quit five minutes ago, actually. But yeah, no, okay. no, no, no. Right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now I'm have, I'm on a local high point. Oh, yes. I think okay. I sort of get the picture. It's very fuzzy, but it's very. It's nice. So yeah. Sure. I really need to think about a lot more about it and how to try to explain it, but. I'll really have to think about it. But, but anyway, thanks a lot for listening, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll see you next time. Okay, thanks for catching or making me catch the mistake in my tenfold ways. Oh, that I'm one. Like, okay, yes. Okay. So that was helpful, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll see you. Okay, bye. Bye.